Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Crowley. I am the chair of the Fire and Criminal Justice Services Committee. Today, this committee will be conducting a vote on five bills related to the process of posting bail. These bills relate to the Department of Correction, New York City Police Department, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I fully support all of these bills and proud that this council will soon pass all five of these bills into law. It should go without saying that individuals with the means to post bail should be afforded every opportunity to do so and should be released without any delay. Yet those charged with crimes and their friends and family who seek to post bail on their cases face numerous barriers in doing so. These five bills will help break down those barriers. I will briefly address each bill individually and afterwards I know that some members who sponsor these bills who are present today would like to say a few words about the bills. And let me just acknowledge my colleagues who are present here today. We have uh, Council Member Paul Vallone and Council Member uh, Fernando Cabrera. Intro 1531 A is sponsored by our speaker, Melissa Mark Veverito. This bill addresses significant issues with the DOC's bail acceptance practices. First, the bill requires DOC to accept bail immediately and continuously throughout a case, eliminated so -called, eliminating so-called blackout periods, where an inmate is in DOC's custody, but the department will not accept bail for that person. Second, the bill will also ensure that inmates for whom bail is posted are released quickly, eliminating any needless delay. Third, the bill requires DOC to accept bail in or near courts or online. This will eliminate any time during which a person is being incarcerated solely because their family or friends must travel hours to get to Rikers Island or another DOC facility in order to post bail. Next bill, Antro 1541A, sponsored by Council Member Gibson. This bill addresses the fact that the majority of inmates who post bail do so within a few days but most of the inmates are unable to post bail from court and instead post bail after being sent to Rikers Island and going through the costly intake process. This bill increases the time during which an inmate may be held in the courthouse immediately after bail is set to give their friends and family a few additional hours to come up with bail money and to avoid that inmate being sent to Rikers Island for intake. Intro 15. 61A, which I sponsored, addresses a fundamental problem within our bail system. Too many inmates are not aware of the full array of options for posting bail, and many not even aware of the amounts and types of bail that have been set in their respective cases. Also, inmates who have the financial means to post bail for themselves are not typically afforded that opportunity in court and may receive the first opportunity to do so while in DOC custody. This bill addresses both these issues by requiring the DOC to provide all inmates with a written summary of their bail and options for paying, bill, inclu paying bail, including the option to post bail for themselves. Intro 1176A is sponsored by Council Member Lansman. This bill addresses a very straightforward issue allowing those arrested for crimes to write down the contact information from their mobile phone or other property, so they know the numbers to call in order to post bail and for any other reason. Intro 1581A, sponsored by Council Member Reynoso, addresses the fact that inaccurate and incomplete information, regardless of the process of posting bail, is common throughout, regarding the process of posting bail, is common throughout the criminal justice system. This bill would require the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to make reasonable efforts to work with the court system to ensure that complete and accurate information regarding the posting of bail is displayed in courthouses. Before we vote, I want to thank all the council members who sponsored these bills as they address important issues facing our uh, detainees in DOC custody. I'd like to thank the staff and the, um, my staff and the committee staff who have worked on these bills. And now I'd like to call the committee clerk for a roll. Vote. Committee Clerk Matthew DiStefano, Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice Services, roll call on intro numbers 1531A, 1541A, 1561A, 1576A, and 1581A. Chair Crowley. 
I vote aye on all. Cabrera. Aye on all. Valone. Aye on all. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the items have been adopted. Council Member Lansman. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the items have been adopted. Now we're going to move to the second part of the hearing where we will hear a testimony on proposed intro 1348A sponsored by council member Robert Cornegie. This committee and this council have taken a deep look at Rikers Island and other city jails during this legislative session and one issue we have examined is the availability of programming to inmates in our city's jails. It has been well established that idle time for inmates is correlated with violence. So programming for inmates has the potential to help address violence, which continues to plague the Department of Correction. Perhaps even more importantly, we know that less than 10% of all DOC inmates are sent to state prison, meaning that the clear majority of inmates are released back into our communities offering these inmates the tools to become productive members of society can only serve to help reduce recidivism. And none of this is meant, not, and none of this is to mention that 85% of our inmates are pre-trial detainees who are presumed to be innocent, offering such pre-trial detainees opportunities for education, vocational training, and treatment for drug or mental issues mental health issues is simply the right thing to do. I look forward to a productive discussion with the administration, criminal justice advocates, and all interested members of the public about their position on this bill. And now I will call up members of the public because I don't believe that the administration is here to testify today. We have uh, from Bronx Connect, uh, Arani Polo, Ariana Polo. We have Jessica Hall from Prison Rights. Nancy Ginsburg with the Legal Aid Society. Ishmael Nazario from the Fortune Society.
Hello, good morning, Chairperson Crawley and all the members of the Fire and Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, my name is Ariani Polo. I'm the manager of our Supreme Court Alternative to Incarceration Program. Bronx Connect is a faith-based, community-based program that offers alternatives to detention and incarceration that connect court-involved youth with positive resources in the local community. Through mentoring relationships, we, provide, we prevent recidivism, recidivism and address youth-initiated goals in education and employment. Bronx Connect was the first Bronx-based alternative to incarceration and alternative to detention program serving our community. We also serve the Bronx in crisis management and cure violence services. Bronx Connect began as a response from the community on the high incarceration rates from our African-American and Hispanic youth. We recently won a Department of Corrections subcontract with the Friends of the Island Academy to provide pre-release services to 60 young adults charged and serving time at Rikers Island. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I testify as a resident of the Bronx, management of a community-based program, staff with members of the community, ex-offenders, and people of color. We have served over 2,000 children and young people over the last 17 years. Bronx Connect has developed its own unique service model to achieve successful outcomes with court-involved youth. Bronx Connect's alternative to incarceration services are based on as many, um, on many of the same assumptions as multi-systematic therapy model, yet include additional services and methodologies unique to its own community context. This has allowed us to have success at keeping youth from, offend, from re -offending. The Bronx Connect program has been the object of a research study published by Trevor Milton. In a collaboration with Bronx Connect, the Foundation for Children, and the New York State Department of Criminal Justice Services conducted a study of our Bronx Connect ATI, Alternative to Incarceration. In Dr. Milton's study, within 12 months of contact with, Bronx Connect, with the Bronx Connect program, only 4.4% of successful graduates of the Bronx Connect were convicted of felony offenses. After three years, only 8.7% of Bronx Connect success, successful graduates who were convicted of a new felony offense. And after five years, only 129 of Bronx Connect successful graduates were convicted of a new felony offense. Bronx Connect fully supports intro 1348A and the efforts to improve the lives of those inmates serving 30 days or more in Rikers Island. The city has an opportunity to intervene in the lives of those affected by incarceration and begin to direct them in other positions. We appreciate the efforts of the city to introduce rehabilitation to our criminal justice system. As a purely punitive system does nothing to change and improve our society and urban communities that have been plagued with excessive arrests. According to the Vera Institute of Justice, up to 60% of adolescents ages 16 to 18 in New York City jails read below the fifth grade reading level. A research study by Public Private Ventures have demonstrated that two-thirds of young adults returning from New York State prisons never return to school. We have found this dismal st statistic to be true and seek to incorporate employment readiness, job placement, and academic enrichment into our programs to support long-term success. According to the New York State Department of Corrections, each year, approximately 75,000 people return to New York City following a period of incarceration in jail or prison. According to data compiled by New York State's Criminal Justice Agency, more than half of defendants sentenced to jail or prison citywide in 2009 were rearrested within a year, and nearly a quarter of them were rearrested for a felony offense. New York City's unemployed and underemployed population is also predominantly made up of African American and Latino males, many of whom have been con who have contact with the criminal justice system. The tough on crimes policy on the war on drugs, especially the aggressive broken window policies and over policing in communities of color have left tens of thousands of African and Latino workers in New York City with some type of prior justice involvement, which will appear on their criminal history report. A New York City study released in 2014 found that by age 18, 30% of black men, 26% of Latino men, and 22% of white men have been arrested. 
Without targeted intervention in, this, in the area of employment education, most of these formerly incarcerated citizens will return to custody. A recent study found that 38% of people released from New York State Department of Corrections uh, and prisons who were originally committed to prison from New York City returned to custody within three years of their release. We are grateful to have won the Friends of the Island Academy the Department of Corrections subcontract to provide six months of pre-release services to 60 young adults in Rikers Island, which include the ability of these young people to receive up to $200 in incentives. Yet, every class, for every class we offer, there are many more youth who want to attend but cannot. Currently, according to Justice Leadership USA, it costs $167,000 per year per person to hold a person in Rikers Island. It only costs between 11000 to 20000 a year per person for a young person to be in an ATI program within their own community. Hire more ATIs like Bronx Connect, an agency that can and will receive young people from Rikers and re rehabilitate them in order to be part of the community they were taken out of. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Nancy Ginsberg. I'm the director of the Legal Aid Society's Adolescent Intervention and Diversion Project in the Criminal Practice, a specialized unit dedicated to the representation of adolescents aged 13 to 18 who are prosecuted in the adult criminal courts. This testimony is based on consultation with our Prisoners' Rights Project. We submit this testimony on behalf of the Legal Aid Society and thank Chair Crowley and the Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice Services for inviting our thoughts on intro 1348A, proposed legislation requiring the Department of Correction to provide vocational or educational programming to individuals held in custody. Our extensive experience indicates that community safety is best protected when appropriate services are identified and access for clients so that they are treated safely and humanely while in the system and less likely to be entangled again in the criminal systems. The Legal Aid Society strongly supports the provision of services to our incarcerated clients. We appreciate the intent of the current legislation, but have concerns about the unintended consequences of the language as set forth. We believe the intent of the legislation is to set a floor for service provision to individuals in the custody of the Department of Correction, and we support that goal. However, we believe the language is both too broad and too limiting to achieve the goals it sets out to reach. We are concerned to the extent that the bill suggests programming could be provided in lieu of education. There are many adolescents and young adults who are entitled to education, either due to compulsory education laws or special education laws, and we are concerned that this bill would allow programming to be provided in lieu of education. We fully support a requirement of five hours of academic services for those entitled or requesting them regardless of their security classification or housing location. The Department of Education currently provides a five hour school day to adolescents enrolled in school and we believe that standard should be maintained by legal mandate. Additionally, it should be ensured that as many individuals as possible should have access to school. Furthermore, the broad brush exemption for circumstances where from the bill education cannot safely be provided is far too vague to address the security aspects of correctional education. There is already existing law and regulation which we can provide off record setting forth the circumstances in which educational programming can be restricted for security reasons. This language should be omitted from this bill. We support the provision of a wide variety of services to all individuals in custody regardless of security classification or housing location. In our experience, a small number of individuals are provided with access to programming while many receive nothing at all. Social services to incarcerated individuals must be increased both to protect them during their incarceration and facilitate their re-entry to society upon release. The period of incarceration presents an opportunity to teach social skills, enhance academic skills, to expose clients to new possibilities for their future. Study after study has shown that those who are incarcerated stay more motivated, prepare for release, and engage in less violence when they have access to productive activities. 
the requirement in the current legislation that limits education and programming to individuals in general population excludes those in specialized housing, including but not limited to protective custody, mental health settings, high security settings. Individuals in alternative settings can benefit from education and programming as much, if not more, than those in general population. Additionally, adolescents and young adults are placed in school in a far shorter time frame than 30 days. It is our position that they should have access to school as soon as possible after being placed in the custody of the DOC and this legislation should formalize the practice that is currently in place or improve upon it. Given the prevalence of individuals classified with special education needs and the percentages of youth and young adults performing, performing far below grade level, connection to the academic setting is critical to their successful reintegration to the community. The Legal Aid Society appreciates and supports the effort that the Department of Correction has made to expand services for adolescents and young adults. We would like to see a wide menu of services provided to the adult population as well, regardless of housing unit or security level. We have seen the access to services improve our clients' ability to meaningfully connect to community-based services. Progress in services reduces periods of incarceration and increased clients' adhesion to community programming upon release. In particular, vocational services are critical to client success upon release and reducing recidivism and improving community outcomes. We look forward to working with the council to refine the language of this legislation so the goals of academic and programming services to all individuals in the custody of the department correction are fully realized. We thank the committee for this public forum. The city council plays and must continue to play an important role in understanding, monitoring, and tracking the conditions of confinement for individuals incarcerated in the city jail system. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, council and committee members, for this opportunity to um, provide testimony. My name is Jessica Hall, and I'm the executive director of Prison Rights. We provide therapeutic writing programs for people who are incarcerated, detained, and formerly incarcerated in alternative to detention programs, alternative to incarceration programs, and so on. Um, and I'm just going to speak to uh, the benefit of writing programs in particular. Uh, to nationally, only about half of incarcerated adults have a high school degree or its equivalent youth in the juvenile justice system are significantly more likely than other youth to be suspended or expelled, have academic skills well below their grade level, possess a learning or developmental disability, and drop out of school. Enrollment in school and academic achievement is associated with lower rates of reoffending and better outcomes into adulthood. Providing meaning meaningful activities in prisons and jails can help alleviate stress, reduce altercations, and increase positive communication, making the overall culture and environment safer for inmates and staff. Writing programs, in particular, serve a therapeutic function while supporting literacy development and continued education. 30 years of research indicates that therapeutic writing results in tangible outcomes that improve overall health and functioning, including improved emotional and physical health, positive behavioral changes, boost in academic ability, improved working efficiency, better sleep habits, and improved connections to others. In over a decade of working with people who've experienced incarceration in New York City, in particular who've cycled through Rikers Island, I've seen them return traumatized and less able to function with a whole new set of problems than when they left and much less able to comply with the terms of their release. So many of the challenges of re-entry are a result of trauma people have suffered while in prison. The suffering of people in this punitive system is a shame for our city and nation and does nothing to prepare them for re-entry. Through humane treatment of people who are incarcerated, including the provision of rehabilitative and educational activities and programs, we can create a narrative of successful re-entry, safer communities, and reduced recidivism rates. Thank you. Before we hear from uh, the remaining uh, members of the public who are here today to testify, I'd like to call on the committee clerk to take a uh, vote from Council Member Eugene. Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice Services, continuation of roll call, Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I vote aye. No one. Thank you. 
Final vote stands, five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, no abstentions. Thank you, thank you, Council Member Eugene. Thank you to the committee clerk. And now we will go back to the testimony and uh, we have one uh, member of the public still. Good morning. My name is Ismail Nazario. I'm a case manager at the Fortune Society. I work with the ICANN program. The Fortune Society is a New York City non-based is a New York City based nonprofit organization. We provide services for nearly 7,000 people per year. Um, our mission is to build people and support them to break the cycle of incarceration and crime. I just want to take the time out to thank you for the opportunity to express my strong support for intro number 1348A, which would require the Department of Corrections to offer vocational and educational programming for people who are incarcerated in the city jails for 30 days or longer. Uh, for the past 50 years, Fortune has worked to promote fair, humane, and truly rehabilitative justice system. And we believe that this legislation represents a major commitment in that direction. At the Fortune Society, we understand and we have intimate knowledge of the, import the importance of providing programming to incarcerated individuals prior to their release. So the ICANN program stands for Individualized Corrections Achievement Network. We're actually funded through the Department of Corrections, NYC, and we provide pre and post release services on Rikers Island and in the community. So we provide services to men and women. We provide an array of group services, such as professional development, relapse prevention, life skills, parenting skills, anger management, and a few other uh, group services that we offer. In addition to that, we also offer hard skills training, such as OSHA 10, CPR, food handlers, and we we provide this to the individuals because once they're, it's preparing them for release for one, and once they have these certifications under their belt, it makes them more marketable and more employable. And that's something that we definitely want to see our participants take you know, part in. So programming being expanded over Rikers Island and MDC will be a great benefit for, for the individuals that are being detained on Rikers Island. Um, Initially, the program started back in 2005 with a program called the RIDE program, which stood for Rikers Island Discharge Enhancement, and we were only providing services to city sentenced individuals at that moment. But once the Department of Corrections and the mayor's office and so on and so forth saw that it was becoming to be a success, then hence the ICANN program was born, and then that began to expand as well. Um, So ICANN programs and programs like it uh, are actually now in the process of helping reduce uh, violence in the jails because it's decreasing idle time for the participants. And I mean, so far it seems to have been working in a, in a, in a great way. Uh, we are in nine facilities on Rikers Island right now, including MDC. Um, lack of programming can result to you know, more idle time and lead to incidents that can compromise the safety of inmates and some of the staff members there. In addition to working inside DOC, Fortune provides support to formerly incarcerated populations post-release. We are also a part of the Alternatives to Incarceration Reentry Coalition, a, co a collaboration of organizations that run community-based programs that provide alternatives to incarceration, as well as training, counseling, education, drug and alcohol treatment, mental health services, anger management, family and parenting services, and other essential tools that help formerly incarcerated participants to find employment and housing and to live stable. We firmly believe that expanding access to structured programming to incarcerated individuals prior to their release will have a positive impact on their lives, increase safety within Rikers Island, and help to end the cycle of crime and incarceration that has plagued our communities for generations. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide to provide Fortune strong support for this legislation. Did everybody who uh, testifies today, does everyone support the bill? Yes. yes. And from what you understand, there's already a, that amount of uh, training. Everyone participates in five hours a day? Yes. This concludes the Fire and Criminal Justice Services hearing of June 19th, 2017. Thank you.